Good afternoon. My name is Jackie Hoyt, and I'm the president of the Johann Foos Library Foundation, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today for our eighth literary event of the season featuring prolific author Elizabeth Winthrop Alsop. We owe a debt of gratitude to our loyal friend and respected literary advisor, Jane Janess, for introducing us to Elizabeth, inviting her to this event today, and hosting her. Thank you. Jane, we also want to, at this time, want to thank you, but also extend our sincere condolences on the, your recent loss. Bob was an important supporter of the Library Foundation, having served as a board member from 2008 to 2013, which was a time of great progress and change for our beloved library. We are thrilled that all of you are here today to hear a lively interview of Elizabeth by our very own executive director, Bobby Marquis. Bobby will be introducing Elizabeth and facilitating the interview in just a minute. Before I turn over the mic to Bobby, I'd like just to say a quick few words about her. As most of you know, Bobby really doesn't need an introduction. She is known and beloved by all. An ardent literary aficionado, Bobby has served as our executive director of the Library Foundation for over six years. During this time, she has truly made an indelible impact on all that is good about our organization. Perhaps most remarkable, while working full time, Bobby recently earned her bachelor's degree in English with a concentration in creative writing from the University of Central Florida with the highest distinction of summa cum laude. <laughs> the foundation is so very, very fortunate to have someone of her caliber at our helm. I now am going to turn over the mic to Bobby for her introduction and interview of Elizabeth. Just a reminder, please silence your cell phones. Bobby? Okay. Thank you, Jackie, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for your support. Um, I'm honored to introduce Elizabeth Winthrop Alsop to you today. Elizabeth and I have been talking for about a year, and I once again thank Jane Janess for introducing me to this brilliant author. Um, Elizabeth grew up in Washington, D.C. She attended Miss Porter's School in Farmington, Connecticut, and graduated from Sarah Lawrence College. I believe that some of her Miss Porter's um, classmates are here with us today. So that's wonderful. It's a small world. Elizabeth is a winner of the Penn Syndicated Fiction Award, and Robert Stone selected her story, The Golden Darters, for Americans' Best Short Stories. Her body of work includes 60 works of fiction for all ages, her fantasy novels for children, The Castle in the Attic, and its sequel, The Battle for the Castle, won 24 state awards. The Castle in the Attic won the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Children's Book Award and the California Young Readers Award. As the daughter of a columnist, Stuart Alsip, and a great-grandniece of Theodore Roosevelt, Elizabeth carries on a long literary tradition. Her newest book is a memoir, Daughter of Spies, Wartime Secrets and Family Lies. It is a fascinating read that depicts a period of history through the lens of one family. The scope of the book is vast, and yet it is deeply personal. Elizabeth's parents, Patricia, known as Tish, and Stuart, both served in secret services during World War II. After the war, they raised their six children in Washington, D.C., where they were part of the Georgetown set. Elizabeth's father, Stuart, and his brother, Joe, were celebrated columnists. In her poignant introduction to Daughter of Spies, Elizabeth writes of her reflections on her mother in her later years, suffering from dementia. Elizabeth bravely took on writing a story that probes deeply into the lives of her parents and how their secrets affected the family. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you Thank so you much. So 
where to begin. Mm. There's so much that you've done, so much that you've written. What inspired you to become a writer? Well, if you come home every afternoon uh, from school and you open the back door and what you hear is the rat-a-tat-tat of an Underwood typewriter. Uh, my father worked at home and he had a sign on his door that I used as a title for a Kindle single called Don't Knock Unless You're Bleeding. <laughs> we all knew not to disturb him. And I remember saying to him at one point, you know, Daddy, this kind of looks like a cushy job. You don't have to go anywhere. People come here to be interviewed. You don't seem to work very hard. And he had three columns a week he had to write. Well, he almost took the Underwood typewriter and brained it over my head. Um, but I definitely began to write in my journal. And when you are in a family with five brothers, you have things you want to keep to yourself. <laughs> So my journal was hidden very, very carefully in my closet. And it was where I put all the things I really cared about and felt about and was scared of. And it then grew into, this is a way to make a living. Wow. Yeah. So. And, and what made it, motivated you to write this book? And why did you focus on your mother? So in uh, 19, when was it, 2008, I published a, no a novel, a work of historical fiction called Counting on Grace. And it was a story of a little girl whose picture was taken by the great child labor photographer, Lewis Hine. Her picture is on a postage stamp. It's on a Nike poster talking about child labor. I didn't care who she was. I just used the picture to imagine a child. And I wrote the book. After I was finished and it was in copy editing, I actually began to feel a little guilty because I thought I really ought to know who this child was. So I found out who she was. Her name was Addie Card. I found out all about her family, all about her childhood, all about where she ended up in life. And when I was done, I thought I know more about this little girl than I know about my own mother. My mother did work in MI5 and signed the Official Secrets Act. So she never told us anything about her war stories. And I realized Daddy was famous, he'd written his own memoir, books had been written about him, plays had been written about him and put up on Broadway. We knew nothing about Mummy. And that's when I thought, okay, let me try to find out. And when you started to discover your mother's life and, and unfold some of the secrets of her past and what she had gone through, what was the source of information for that? Well, I had a lot. The first I had was Daddy's memoir. And, and Daddy had written 207 pages of letters from World War II. All three of my grandmother's sons were in the war. My father uh, was fought in Italy with the King's Royal Rifle Corps because he couldn't get into the American Army. He had high blood pressure and asthma. My uncle John was in the military police and ended up parachuting behind enemy lines into France the way my father did. And my uncle Joe was in China uh, fighting with Chiang Kai-shek. So all of these brothers wrote letters and my grandmother had them all typed and sent them out to the family. So there was a huge trove oh, mm -hmm. of war letters. Wow. However, that wasn't anything really enough about mummy. Mm -hmm. He had written about her, but not that much. So then we moved my mother in, we always laugh, from the 11 bedroom house to the four bedroom house, which she considered downsizing. <laughs> and we went into the basement because we just moved things. We didn't have time to go through them. And I found a treasure trove, letters, my, my mother grew up in Gibraltar. There were deeds. There were land certificates. There was everything you can imagine down there. And then I began to tape her. It was very hard to get her to open up because she was British, keep calm and carry on. And she was very reserved and quite shy. But once I began to really ask her the stories, she just blossomed. And that gave me the whole kind of corpus that I could work from. Now, was this before she started to develop dementia? Yes, I started about two years before the dementia. Um, but then what happened as she began to slip away from us, 
I found that I could bring the letters up. For example, my father wrote his parents five days after he met my mother and said, I've met the woman I'm going to marry. Now, they had heard this before. <laughs> and he was slightly a mess in the kitchen sink, Daddy. Things, you know, there was a great interview that Dick Cavett did with him at the very end of his life when he wrote a book called Stay of Execution about dying of leukemia. And I looked at that interview and I realized Daddy had different color socks on. <laughs> that was my father. My mother, when they met, he was 28 and she was 16. But he definitely thought, this woman, she's going to be efficient and take care of me. And um, so there was that kind of, uh, he had written his parents about how beautiful she was and so on and so forth. I would take a letter like that and read it to my mother when she was in dementia. And a detail would come out. She'd say, well, of course, I never heard that letter before, you know, went to... And I said, but mommy, look how in love with you he was. Oh, pish, she said. You know, I mean, that was her way. Yeah. But you could see her just light up and come back to me. Oh, gosh. So I also interviewed her. I interviewed her on tape. And then we interviewed her on videotape. And the first videotape interview was her childhood in Gibraltar. And then the second one was World War II in London. And we used those tapes all through the dementia, right up till the very end, to keep bringing her back. I mean, I could play her um, Vera Lynn music. You remember the great Vera Lynn World War II songs, the English? She would sit up and sort of go back there. Or she would give me one more detail. So I would say, well, your father was in the home guard. Oh, yes, she said. We always called it dad's army. You know, I mean, she had the best moment was when I was looking through Gibraltar um, photo albums. And there was a picture in Mummy in her brownie outfit and her two dogs, Romulus and Remus, who were corgis, of course. She was born three weeks before Queen Elizabeth. And they were all dressed up. My grandfather was in a top hat. I said, what's going on here? And she said, it was when George VI was coron you know, crowned coronation in 1937. And then out of the blue, she started to sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Mrs. Wallace Stole Our King. <laughs> <laughs> out of the blue. Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Simpson Stole Our King. So yeah, anyway, yeah. that was the details that you would always get more. It, it sounds like by discovering those letters and by sort of getting inspired to write this story, um, it, it almost gave you an opportunity to have an experience with your mother that you wouldn't have had. Absolutely true. It, it, I, it, it came full circle. Plus, I had no idea how brave she was. You know, I had grown, I, you're a kid. What do you know about your parents? And so that was the beauty of it, was that I was really got her to talk about what it was like to be, I don't know, you know, she was evacuated from Gibraltar right up through Dunkirk. She, it was May of 1940. They were put on a boat out of Gibraltar. All the women and children, two ships, were sent up. And the idea was they were to go into Southampton Harbor. And the boats had all been de-goused. That meant that they had put sort of um, demagnetized things so that the, the mines, the German mines, couldn't attach and blow them up. So she said the ship in front went into Southampton Harbor and it blew up. These were her friends. These were her, you know, people she knew in the water, dying, screaming. And her answer, this is so mummy, she said, we didn't want to be blown up. She said, so my, our captain backed up the ship. And instead of going into Southampton, they went up along the cliffs of Dover on May 28, 1940. And she said, we were maintaining radio silence. It was a bluebird day. You could see the barrage balloons going up and down the channel. And there were all these boats crossing. It was very early in Dunkirk. So it wasn't the little boats. It was the big boats. She said, we had no idea what was going on. We finally got into Tilbury Port. And lo and behold, we found out that they were taking the British Expeditionary Force off Dunkirk. That was the kind of history she lived mm -hmm. with. 
and we never heard about. And I think it's fascinating that she actually had a glimpse of the Spanish Civil War before yeah. she left Gibraltar. True? She was 10 years old. She was born in 1926. So in 1936, when the Spanish Civil War started, the worst battles in the very beginning were in Algeciras. And Mummy lived in Gibraltar. And she said, we went up to the top flat uh, roof of our building and all of the people that she was with, her parents were out to dinner, there were maids and they were screaming because they could see the uh, bombs coming across and their families were on fire. Al Jazeera was burning up. And so she ran downstairs and hid in bed with the one spaniel who she said shook more than she did. And she, you know, that was her life. She, I said, well, mommy, how was the rest of the Spanish Civil War? She said it moved away from us. Mm -hmm. And she, we believed that both sides were in the wrong. That was interesting to me. She said people were thrown off the cliffs in Ronda, which is a very famous part of Spain where the cliffs are, are like this. Um, so she had already been through a war. Uh, there was one other story. She was coming down with her parents. They ended up and they were coming through San Sebastian and mommy got pink eye. So they took uh, her mother and her brother, and she went into the normal Madrid ophthalmologist eye doctor that was going to solve this. And when they walked in, the, every single seat in the waiting room was taken up with a German soldier. And the nurse said to my mother, you will have to wait until the very end. We have to serve all these people first. And that was exactly the case, because of course the Germans were practicing, and they were doing all of Franco's dirty work. Oh, wow. So she had already been through that when she got to World War II. And then her whole family, they moved to England. Right. And um, I'm just wondering, right now, I'm kind of at the edge of my seat, and I've read the book, but um, I know she's had, she had a very exciting childhood, but then she had a major transition at a very young age yeah. to yeah. her adult life. Yeah, she went to a boarding school in uh, England called Poles. It was a, my mother was Catholic, so it was a Catholic boarding school, British Catholic, which is rare. And um, she graduated from there with the ability at the age of 16 to take the uh, test for Oxford. And her parents said no, she was not allowed to do that. And because they wanted her to do war work. So in the summer between graduating from Poles and going to the secretarial school to do war work, she lived with her best friend's family. Her best friend's father was a man named um, Lord Mowbray. He was a premier baron of England. The premier baron means you can trace your history back to before Henry VIII, Catholic all the way before Henry VIII. So they lived in what my father called a ghastly pile, which meant a huge Victorian house with endless hallways, etc. And the Royal Canadian Air Force decided to requisition the castle. So they had one big party and to say goodbye to the castle. And um, mommy said we had to hoover all the halls. That was meaning vacuuming. <laughs> um, there was very little staff. There was one butler with a wooden leg and uh, I think a cook. But it was definitely a, a, a skinny staff for the who they were coming. They invited these Yankee soldiers from York, which is where my father was training with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. So they came, Mummy sat next to Daddy, she was 16, he was 28, and she looked at him and said, you look like a criminal. <laughs> Great opening First line. words. First words. And, and that was because, of course, he'd had his head shaved for the army. He was immediately charmed. <laughs> he said, all the other women I've met were at Long Island debutante parties, and they chattered. He said, your mother did not chatter. I said, you bet. So that was the first time he yeah. met, and he pursued her. It was insane. He was 28. She was 16. He wrote home and said he had met the daughter of a belted earl, completely made up. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first man she ever kissed. And she kissed him in the Rose Garden at 1.30 in the morning of Allerton Park, where my husband and I have been. And we have sat at the table where they met. It's a you know, stately home. And it was reported to Lady Mowbray that 
Tish had been kissed by a Yankee. And therefore, <laughs> she wrote to my grandmother and she said, Cecilia, darling, you must do something to curb Tish's hot Spanish blood. <laughs> Because that line, the, the female line, was Spanish. Yeah. But we discovered the reason that anybody reported that she'd been kissed by the Yankee soldier was that Lord Mowbray was in the other corner of the garden kissing his mistress. <laughs> what a life. Oh, gosh. Now, with all these stories, I want to ask, why did you decide to write this as a memoir uh, rather than as a novel? Yeah. So I started this as a novel. I thought, oh, this is great material. I'm going to write this terrific love story, you know, courting my mother and my father. It was absolutely flat on the page. And the reason is everybody knew who read it that I wasn't there, so that it was a reported story. And that's when I decided, and I'd never done this before, I decided I was going to do what they call in the business a braided narrative which meant I went back and forth between mummy in dementia and 17-year-old mummy, you know, doing war work. And it, it was a good way to keep the story alive because I was in the part about the dementia. Yeah, yeah. It wove. And you come into the story more in the second part, right? Yeah. Um, and briefly, can we just talk about how your mom ended up in the United States and how your parents ended up together? So mommy, daddy pursued mommy uh, quite diligently, but my grandparents, my British grandparents were, were very stuffy. And it took them a long time because their son was in the King's Royal Rifle Corps and very sadly was dive bombed by a Stuka and killed at the age of 21 on exactly the day my mother met my father. August 31st, 1942. So they were suffering from this terrible loss, and Daddy pursued Mummy and was allowed to take her to the British Museum, but that was about it. And so Daddy gave up, and he went off and met another peaches and cream girl. So yet again, he writes home, oh, I've now found the woman of it. <laughs> and they were at, it's quite funny, because March 17th, 1943, my mother turned 17. She was born on St. Patrick's Day, which is why her name was Patricia. And she basically uh, met my father again at the Queen Charlotte Ball, which was a debutante party that was still held during the war. And she saw him up in the balcony with the peaches and cream girl dressed in a black dress. Well, my mother just marched right upstairs <laughs> and tapped him on the shoulder and said, whatever happened to you? <laughs> he said to the peaches and cream girl, I better dance with her. And that was the end of that. Never saw the peaches and cream girl again. So it was quite a torrid romance. He then almost immediately left for Italy. He fought in Italy. He came back through. He uh, joined the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. He jumped behind enemy lines into France. And then he came, he got, mummy got pregnant during the honeymoon, lost the baby during a bombing raid in London in August of 44. He come back out of France in October. He gets her pregnant again and uh, goes back into France. And then it's decided that she has to get to America because in England, the baby could not be larger than six months in utero or you would have to stay there till the baby was two years old. And they wanted that child to be born in America. So mummy gets on a, a ship in a convoy. She's in a room with seven other women and one eight-year-old boy. And they cross the North Atlantic in convoy December and January of 1944. It takes them three weeks to get across the Atlantic. The ship is a Royal Mail ship, and it's so late in the war, they don't have the wood to plank it. So nobody's allowed out on the deck because it's so cold and wet, and the, the metal is so slippery. So they spend their whole time playing hearts inside, and they get to the other side. Years later, when my oldest brother Joe, who was in utero on that ship, turned 29, he had a stroke. Extremely rare, right? 
and the doctor said to him, you better call your mother and ask her about the in utero experience. So he calls up and mummy says, well, the little boy had German measles and I caught it. She had never told us this. That's the kind of detail that we never knew growing up. And this all came out of the letters? Some of it came out of the letters. A lot of it came out of my questioning her. And then she remembered. And re remembered. And it was very hard to get her to be emotional. So her, her, my, my grandfather, for example, crossed from Gibraltar, was evacuated uh, as a man later than the others. And, and Mummy said he was so foolish. He thought he could get Romulus and Remus through quarantine because you were not allowed to bring a dog into England because it was one more mouth to feed. So he gets to Tilbury Port, he gets to the quarantine officer, and the guy says, are you kidding? We can't take the dogs. So they shot them and buried them at sea, threw them in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mommy, how horrible. She said, well, what, what else would we have done? She said, of course, you can't oh. possibly feed dogs. You know, I mean, yeah. she just pushed away. Every yeah. time I felt the emotion I thought she should be feeling, she would push back on yeah. me. Yeah, well, oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. And, and then you, when you shift gears in the book and you, you begin part two, you're now in your life. You're in Washington, and your family is um, growing up right. You with your siblings. And your parents are heavily involved with the Georgetown set. That's right. And that's really the stuff of movies. <laughs> and when is. you describe it, though, in that section, we really are shown what life was like behind the curtain. Yeah, from the child's point mm -hmm. of view. Mm -hmm. I was telling Bobby earlier, the first part of the book is part one is braided narrative, back and forth. The third part of the book is braided narrative, back and forth, much more myself and my mother and losing her. The middle part of the book, I was determined. See, if you grow up, my mother was an alcoholic. If you grow up in an alcoholic childhood, alcoholism is front and center stage. So I was always having to move over to let that situation be front and center. So when it came to writing about my childhood, I didn't want to share the stage with my mother. I didn't want the reader, and it shocked me how strongly I felt this, I did not want the reader sympathizing with her because I had not had a mother during my childhood. So it's a very stark, realistic sort of life inside the house. So there's a reason the book is called Wartime Secrets, Family Lies. My mother worked for MI5 as a decoding agent. She told my father she worked in the passport office. My father dropped behind enemy lines into France. He could not tell her where he was dropping. So from the very beginning of their lives, they kept secrets from one another. And that passed into the marriage. Now, if you grow up in Washington and your father's a columnist and your uncle's a columnist and all of your father's best friends are in the CIA, everybody's keeping secrets from everybody else. And they're all trying to get secrets out of each other because, of course, secrets are power in Washington. So we grew up, I have five brothers, Joe, Ian, me, and then the younger ones, Stuart, Nikki, Andrew. So the ones who were really close were Joe, me, and Ian, the three to oldest ones. And sometimes we would let Stuart do things, but not too often. <laughs> and so I would come home in the afternoon, and my brother Ian, who got home before I did, would go like this or like this. This meant, it's OK. It's OK. She's not locked in the bedroom. This meant, scatter. Get out of the way. So we would all go down to the basement where my brother Joe, who was an engineer and a mechanical genius, was thinking up various terrible things to do the parents. <laughs> so the first major thing we did was my father bet my brother that he could not bug a dinner party in Washington without daddy knowing. So we ran the wire up the table. We put the microphone right by daddy's chair. And we took tape recording. And he bet him 50 bucks. That was a lot of money. 
So the next day, Joe walked into the living room with the wall and sack reel-to-reel -reel recorder, plunked it down, and hit play. And Daddy said, what's this? And he said, last night's dinner party. <laughs> Daddy stood up, peeled off five tens, handed them over, and we were in business. So, <laughs> <laughs> and we had a lot of things like that. We dug, uh, we dug a bomb shelter in the front yard, 14 feet deep. We, um, Joe and his best friend, Dick Bissell. Dick Bissell's father was deputy director of the CIA, responsible for the Bay of Pigs. Now, Dick had already, Richard had already dropped a microphone down Dick Bissell's chimney, which nobody discovered. I mean, they were also worried about, you know, someone attacking from the outside when it was actually happening inside. So, Joe and I, Joe decided that they were, we were going to run a telephone line through the storm sewers of Washington. <laughs> and I was designated to go down there with him <laughs> because I could stand up in the culvert. Now, it's storm sewers, right? It's not, the, not the nasty sewer, but there were slugs, there were rats, there were all manner of unhappy things down there. And Joe had built a pallet with wheels. So he would push himself along, lying on his back, unreeling the wire, while I would plug it onto the walls. I would tape it onto the walls. I had the torch. I knocked the slugs off the walls. And he had this idea, sort of like the sewers of Paris, that the storm sewer would take a right on Reno Road and go up to Dick Bissell's house. Well, it didn't do any such thing. It went across, and we ended up in the middle of a park. So we got up, we got out, we rolled up our wire. Can you imagine driving down Reno Road in Washington? There is someone carrying a pallet, a huge roll of wires, some little kid trailing behind with the, you know, with the torch. And it was ridiculous. But anyway, then Richard Bissell and Joe ran it right along the telephone wires. So it worked. We had our own private telephone system. And we wired the whole street. But at one point in the sewer, I said, Joe, why, why are we doing this? <laughs> and he said, so the grown-ups can't hear what we're saying. <laughs> and I said, do you think they care? <laughs> but it was all this kind of anti-grown-up yeah, scheme, yeah. using so many of the same things the CIA used. We adopted their methods. It was very well. To, to finish the story, Joe ended up at the Groton School, where he bugged the headmaster's study and took tape recordings of all the faculty meetings. So, you know, it was a life of crime. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, it strikes me, as I'm listening to these great stories of kids' adventures, how maybe these were um, sort of the catalyst for your um, battle for the castle and castle in the attic Definitely. fantasies. Definitely yeah. the children's books came from a lot of those. And people always wanted me to write Joe's story. And in fact, they've even said, we should have a movie and Joe should be the star, because <laughs> he really did save us in a way. He was, he was our downstairs father. When things got too scary upstairs, he would just order us around, give us a focus, structure mm -hmm. our lives. We grumbled, but it, mm -hmm. it made you feel safe. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, well, during that time of your childhood, um, I know Mrs. L played a key role. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about Mrs. L and any of the other adult role models that you had during that time. Yeah, well, Mrs. L was the major one. So Mrs. L was Alice Roosevelt Longworth. So my grandmother, my great-grandmother is Theodore Roosevelt's sister. So my grandmother and Alice and Eleanor were all first cousins. And Alice, of course, lived in Washington. And I got to know her for many reasons, one of which was her granddaughter and I went to the same Catholic school. But every Thursday afternoon, Mrs. L, as we called her, would pull up to Stone Ridge. She was the only one allowed to pull up to the front door. Great big black Cadillac, driven by Turner, who was fantastic. And we would get in the back, and Joanna and I would sit there, and Mrs. L would be in full lotus position in a black hat like this, and she would begin to recite the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. <laughs> and 
And Joanna would say, oh, Grammy, stop showing off. <laughs> so then we'd drop Joanna at a farm where she would go riding, and I would get to go all the way into town with Mrs. L and have tea. Now, driving with Mrs. L, she didn't drive, uh, was Turner did all the driving, very old Cadillac. And Turner was great. He would drive along like this implacably. And Mrs. L would lean forward and say, forward and say Turner, I think you hit something back there. And Turner would say, yes, ma'am, I think I did. <laughs> and I mean, you'd see these people going by, just like this. <laughs> we'd get into the house, we'd go upstairs, and the whole reason I was invited, I think, was because I was an eavesdropper. And she wanted to know who Daddy and Mommy had had to dinner, what they wore, what did Mrs. Braden wear, who did she speak to, what did they talk about. So I was, it was perfect. I got this break, I got tea. The funniest thing was Mrs. L had these, all of TR's old skins hanging off the walls as you came down from, from her, her dining room. And one day, Daddy, having a little too much drink taken, came down and he shook hands with a leopard. And uh, the paw completely came off. <laughs> and he looked at it and he went, <laughs> And the next time I went to see Mrs. L, she said, you know, I do not know what happened to that, that skin. And I said, no, me either. I don't either know what happened. <laughs> oh, gosh. She was classic. Unbelievable stories. I love um, the quote from your father um, that I, I heard on one of your interviews. I don't know if it's in the book, but you talk about how once you started to write and talk about some family secrets your dad had had an interesting comment. Yes, he said, I'm going to run out of family and friends before I run out of my books. <laughs> yeah. Part of that, Daddy was uh, 57 when he was diagnosed with leukemia. And he died when he was 60. I was, I was pregnant with his first grandchild, my daughter Eliza, who we never met. But I had written one novel, and I showed it to him. And it was about him. And it was about a farm we had in Maryland, and you know the main male character was based on Daddy, and that's why he made that comment. But the thing, the one piece of advice I got from him as an editor, I never forgot. I had written in the book, you know, remember very early on. I said, Emily, cross the room, grasp the doorknob, pull the door towards her, and walked out. And Daddy wrote in the margin. Unless Emily crawls bleeding from the room, <laughs> I suggest you say, Emily left the room. <laughs> we all leave a room in approximately the same way. That's so great. So I had a huge sign in front of my writing desk for years, Emily left the room. <laughs> so, um, a, a little change of topic here. Just wondering, was it difficult for you to write about challenging topics of alcoholism and dementia, and especially where it hits so close to home in your own personal life? It was hard. I, have, I had written a novel a long time ago called Knock Knock Who's There, about two boys whose father dies of a, a blood disease, and after he dies, their mother, uh, they discover their mother's an alcoholic. I had an uncle who said, every time Elizabeth writes a book, it's like dodging a bullet. <laughs> and mommy got hit with that one. And we had a very serious, very hard heart to heart. Mm -hmm. She was at that point sober. Um, I could not, I admit, I could not have published this book when my mother was alive. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the release to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. Not only about, well, mainly about how hard it was to grow up as the child of an alcoholic, but also I was able to talk to her about it. And there is very one section in the book where very late in the dementia, she says to me, what was it like when I was drunk? And she'd never asked that question before. And I was very honest. I said, you know, mommy, I, would, I never knew. I never knew what I was going to get. It was like walking through a minefield. My mother was what they call a chemical alcoholic. She never drank in front of us. So the bottles were under the bed, and she just took one sip, and she'd be this other person. So Ian and I kept throwing around words like mentally ill and schizophrenic, because we really didn't know until, much, until we were in college. Um, 
So we had this very honest conversation. She began to cry. And this was literally months before she died. And I held back. I did not say, oh, it's OK. We won't talk about it anymore. I handed her a box of Kleenex. Because it was the closest we could come to a closure. And it was the closest she could come to doing what they call in program the fist step, you know, a real apology. Mm -hmm. She said, this must have been so hard for you. So I felt in the end that it was a good thing. It was not that it was that cathartic or that it healed everything, but it was a, I wasn't going to write this book if I couldn't be completely honest. Mm -hmm. There was no point. And you can't let the cat half out of the bag, as one of my yeah. editors once mm -hmm. said. If you're going to go, tell the whole story. Elizabeth, I've said this to you, and I, I want to say it again, because I think it's a profound truth of this book, that even though you're writing about these very personal, very challenging themes um, that, of course, have affected you in your life, you are doing it with so much um, clarity and as someone who obviously has grown and learned from it. I don't get the feeling like it's an indulgent, a self-indulgent book, but rather it's something that you're sharing. And I, I think it's an excellent book. I'm, I'm thrilled that I had a chance to meet you and talk to you about it. Because I think all of us have experiences in our lives where we can relate to some of these truths that you've spoken. I think that's true. And I had very good advice from Tobias Wolf, who is really, you probably read his book, This Boy's Life, et cetera. Mm -hmm. He said to me, uh, take no care for your dignity when you're writing a memoir. Do not be afraid to appear venal, scheming, amoral, immoral. I mean, his list was so long. He said, the worst kind of memoir is when you say that person was horrible and poor me. Mm -hmm. He said, turn the light as brightly on yourself, which is why I included the whole story of, of um, stealing Julie Nixon's doll. Yeah. I mean, I was a venal <laughs> child, clearly. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell it real quickly? I will. I know. I, <laughs> and then we'll do a Q&A. Then we'll do a Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the story was that uh, my father was writing the first um, real sort of biographical article about Richard Nixon. He had not, Dick, Tricky Dick, had not allowed anybody to do that. And so he finally trusted my father enough, and it was my father's first big article for the Saturday Evening Post. Well, Pat Nixon called up my mother, because Julie and I are the same age, and, she, and I didn't know Julie from a hole in the wall, and she said, oh, we'd love Elizabeth to come over and play. Well, what Pat Nixon didn't know that if we ran through the dining through the living room when Daddy was working, or you know, he'd look and he'd say, "Well, now which one is that?" You know, I mean, he, there were so many of us; he couldn't keep us straight. He never paid any attention to birthdays. So, if I if if I went to Julie Nixon's house, it was not going to make one iota of difference to what my father wrote about Dick Nixon. So I was really grumpy. Mommy made me put on a dress because I usually wore Ian's hand-me-down clothes. I was a tomboy, hated dolls. Got to Julie Nixon's house, and Pat had decorated everything very prettily. And there were, you know, we were upstairs, and we were playing with Julie's dolls. And then my mother was coming to pick me up, and Mrs. Nixon called up and said, Elizabeth, your mother will be here soon. So I picked up Julie Nixon's favorite doll. <laughs> and I marched downstairs, clutching it. And I got to the the kitchen, and Pat said, oh, darling, uh, uh, what is that? <laughs> and Julie threw herself on the floor and said, that is my favorite doll, and she's stealing it. <laughs> and Pat, of course, said, Julie, stop that terrible behavior. Of course she can have the doll. <laughs> but I did not want my mother coming in, because yeah. I knew I'd be in trouble. So I said, OK, goodbye, 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 thank you. <laughs> Jump. Shot outside to the car, jumped in the car. Mommy said, did you say thank you? Yes, I said thank you. What is that? She said. I said, that's a doll. She said, you hate dolls. I said, well, Julie gave it to me. <laughs> Took it home, oh. threw it immediately up in the closet. I wouldn't have my brothers see me with a doll. But there was something strange about growing up in Washington where I knew intuitively I had this little piece of power. 
<laughs> and I was going to use it, even if I didn't want the bloody yeah, dog. Yeah. So that is what I mean about you've got to turn that focus on yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's so. good. Um, Elizabeth, would you read a little segment? I don't segment? know if we have time. Should we do, yeah. we sh should I read or should we have questions? Read? OK. This is, this is a funny part. You're going to hear, um, uh, it's not too long. You'll be glad to know. So I'm wondering, I'm thinking I'm going to stand up. Because it'd be easier? OK. My mother was never a fashionable dresser. When she was growing up in Gibraltar, her mother and the dressmaker chose all her clothes. During the war in England, when they couldn't get their hands on extra material, she made do with one or two outfits for work and a Sunday dress for church. For her wedding, she'd had her tennis dress, the only white outfit in her clothes closet altered for the ceremony. She was someone who made do and was proud of it. So it's not surprising that she had no idea how to dress an American girl. My mother seemed to find all her children mystifying, but me most of all, perhaps because I came after the two boys, or because she'd never had a sister, or because she and her mother were not close. One day, on the way to school in the carpool, I asked her if I could have a bra. Without thinking, she said, but whatever for, dear? <laughs> She was right, of course. I didn't even have the breasts for a training bra. But sitting in the front seat next to her, I shrank away into silence and prayed she wouldn't bring it up again. She didn't. In the sixth grade, when I was the last girl in dancing school, still wearing black leather patent shoes and little white socks, I screwed up my, cur my courage and asked her if I could please have stockings. She looked as if she found this request peculiar. Really? What color? What color? Aren't all stockings the same color? The question threw me so far off that my mind went completely blank. She was waiting for an answer. Whenever my mother had to wait on one of us, I could sense a tapping foot, a ticking clock. Her patience was running out. Black, I blurted out, <laughs> the first thing that came to mind. She frowned, and then she shrugged. Black? Are you sure? No, of course I don't want black stockings. What a ridiculous idea. Mommy, forget that, I wanted to say. Why did you ask me for a color? Stockings don't have a color. They look like your legs. But the conversation was over, and I could think of no way to rewind the tape. The next day, I found a pair of black tights on my bed, thick black tights, the kind they wore in England when she went to the Catholic boarding school with its drafty rooms and no central heat. What mother would send her 12-year-old daughter to dancing school in a blue smocked short sleeve dress with a white color ordered by her grandmother from Harrods in London and black wool tights? My mother. Since Ian and I were only 13 months apart, we were enrolled in the same class at Mrs. Shippen's dancing school. As we headed out the door to get into the car where my mother was waiting, my father, settled in his comfortable easy chair in the living room, put down his paper for a moment to look at me. Good heavens, he remarked. Next time I see you, you'll be reading Mein Kampf. <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was worried. Instead of fading into the crowd of girls lined up on one side of the room or primping in the bathroom, I was going to stand out like a sore thumb. I should have stuck with the little white socks. It seemed the two hours would never end. Mrs. Shippen, even Mrs. Shippen, who usually sat like Queen Victoria in stern, lumpish silence on her throne at the end of the room, gasped as I passed by. <laughs> Nobody actually pointed, but I could feel the eyes burning into my back, and I could hear the muffled whispers and giggles. Later, Ian told me that he took pity on me and bribed one boy to dance with me. His classmate, Al Gore, of all people, 
steered me woodenly around the room <laughs> in the one obligatory dance, dance they'd agreed to and hurriedly returned to the boy's side to collect his dollar. <laughs> I went back to the white socks until I could save enough allowance to buy my own stockings at Murphy's Five and Dime on Wisconsin Avenue. If my mother noticed, she didn't mention it. <laughs> We have time for some questions. Okay. Yeah. And we do have some time for questions if there are, um, if you've filled out a card to. That's okay. I can, they can hand them to me. Or I can take a few before. Do you want to take a few on? Yeah, I'm happy to take without a card until people are. Okay. Have cards if there's anybody. Yes. Oh, yes. I thoroughly enjoyed your book, but reading through the whole thing, there seemed to be a line that stranded me. What did your parents talk about when they were rarely together? During the war, what did my parents? Yeah. Washington, he was gone six months of the year. She was locked in the room. He came home and impregnated her. Exactly. So, and then she was, you know, her conversation ability with her children was. Right, limited. What did my parents talk about? I would say being members of the Georgetown set, they talked about politics. They talked about who had told whom which secret. Mummy would report if she had been to the emergency room in the hospital, who was in there, who was in the drying out wing. You know, I mean, it was all a lot of that kind of thing. And they shared those war stories. So they did share that background. When she first came, home, came to America not knowing one soul, uh, her first dinner party, she sat next to Felix Frankfurter. And she told me that in the rooms, the men would all be attracted to her, not because she was 18 and beautiful, but because she had been in London being bombed. And they felt a kinship to her that the women didn't have. And it didn't help her because she was young and beautiful and the women were more and more jealous. We have another question that's sort of along the same lines. What happened to your pregnant mom when she arrived in the US? Did she have any family here? No family, but my, my father's mother met her at the New York docks um, with her two best friends, Mrs. Blagden and Mrs. Lindley. They scooped up mummy and they took her to the Colony Club, which is a fancy women's club in New York, right? I just did a talk there, so it was quite funny. She arrived and they sat her at the table. She was in her woolies because she'd been in, on this boat. She was pregnant with Joe and she fainted dead away. And she slid under the table. And then the ladies all took their um, printed lunch menus and fanned her. She said she woke up. And you know how in those days women often wore fox furs with little heads with yeah, beady yeah, little. Yeah. She said all these weird animals were looking. <laughs> so my grandmother then uh, said to her, told her something she didn't know. She said, your husband, Stuart, crossed on the Queen Mary. He got here before you. He has been down in, in Washington meeting with Wild Bill Donovan, head of the OSS, seeing his brother John, who was about to be shipped off to China, and he will meet you at cousin Helen Roosevelt's apartment on Park Avenue and wherever. And at that point in the book, I say, I don't go any farther. I let them find each other. Oh, but that, yeah. that was a shock to her. Yeah. Wow. So. Does anyone else have another question? We have time for one more. Yes. What, uh, what, if you know, what did happen to that ball? <laughs> <laughs> the same thing that happened to my wedding dress. What happened to the doll? The same thing. My mother was a big closet cleaner. About a week after I got married, she took my wedding dress to the thrift shop along with the doll. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, Elizabeth, I could listen to you tell stories all day. <laughs> It, and the book is fascinating. We do have some copies for sale over there by the Shell Collection. And Elizabeth is kind enough oh, to sign. offer to sign for us over there as well. So 
I want to thank you, Elizabeth. It's been wonderful having you here today.